of um, picture that the research paints, because when we're talking about self-regulated learning, we're talking about something that's taking place in this broad tradition of, of learning to learn. So we need to understand a bit about that, a very brief, very brief history of learning to learn. Um, and then we're going to get into defining some terms, like what do we mean when we talk about these terms, self-regulated learning, self-regulation, metacognition, like what's the difference between self-regulation and self-regulated learning? Why is it that metacognition and self-regulation seem to go around together as though they're sort of joined at the hip? What's the difference between these terms? How do they overlap? How do they interact and so on? So we're going to get into all of that. And that's really important to do that, I think. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm a busy teacher. I don't want to deal with all this theory. But I think that we actually really need to focus on theory. And I know that this is something that Nahida has been focusing on a lot through the, through the uh, TRN already, that it's important to understand the theory because then you can apply these ideas from first principles rather than just learning tools and strategies that you can take off the shelf. If you understand the, what it means in, on a theoretical level, you, you're much more able to, to implement this in practice, in my view and in my experience. Then we're going to look at practice and in particular I'm going to start that that section thinking about the difference between narrow and broad conceptions of metacognition because how you think about metacognition affects quite profoundly how, how you implement these ideas in practice and we're going to think about what this looks like in the classroom what does a self-regulated learner look like should you ever encounter one in the wild um, and then we're going to focus on some practical strategies. And as I say, we're going to get more into this as we move through the, the, the other sessions throughout the year. But I'm going to give you some takeaways from this the, under four headings uh, that you can see there. Self-regulation, metacognition, oracy and self-regulated learning. And then, as I say, we're going to end with a bit of focus on implementation science, thinking about two really key ideas, complex interventions and theory in action as something that you really need to get your head around because you want to you want to have a solid foundation if you're going to implement some change it needs to be to be built on solid foundations and then there's a brilliant tool one of my favorite implementation tools which i refer to as steps to success and that will bring us to to the end and we should be finishing by about quarter to six and this by the way is a person whose actual name is general gist Apologies if you've seen me present before and make that joke, but it is just one of my favourite things. And it actually pays a visit to his Wikipedia page, not now, obviously, but uh, at a time of your choosing. He's a fascinating person from history um, with also, you know, a silly name. So um, let's start with a question. I will, I will stop showing my screen in a moment. I'd like you to use the chat box at this point and indeed throughout this talk, please use the chat box because there's going to be a few stopping off points. I'm going to have a few, a couple of pauses throughout this session and I want you to contribute your ideas. But if you have any questions that arise during my talk or if you just want to make a note or you just want to make a note of something that I said, please um, do light up the chat box. So my question is this, if you, could, if, you, if you could wave a magic wand, if you could change one thing about your pupils, what would it be? Okay, I'll give you a moment to have a think and to enter some ideas into the chat box and I'll stop. Oh, hang on, I might be able to, if I do this, yeah, I can see the chat box and my slides at the same time. Okay, we've had the first entry to be an independent learner. Thank you to know their weaknesses. Not give up. Mm. Resilience. Oh, resilience coming through strong. That's interesting. Resistance. Yeah, we've also got a few for memory, improved memory. We had retention earlier. Can do attitude. <laughs> Same life experiences. Absolutely agree, Lauren. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Problem solving, independence, resilience to self-regulate. Yeah, thank you. Ask questions. So this is an interesting thing. I've asked many, many people this question over the years and, um, and you get a range of answers. Some people say like things like, I want them all to read for pleasure. I want them to remember stuff um, more effectively. I want them to be really knowledgeable. Seems to be a, a, a new one that everybody's very keen on. Um, but by far and away, in uh, in my experience and also in this chat box here we see a we see a theme emerge when we ask teachers this question we've had independence here we've had we want them to be more resilient to be more confident to be proactive 
sometimes people frame it in quite negative language. They say, I want them to be less needy. I want to stop having to spoon feed them so much. At the start of our book, we, we, um, I once asked this question um, on, on Twitter, um, what, are the, what are the kinds of helpless questions that kids ask you? And we were inundated with responses. And it's things, just things that it's not, almost not even a question. Sometimes they just go like, oh, my pencil is broken. So it's total like helpless, helpless utterance or like questions like, what should I do with the rubbish? Or where do I get the water from and so on? And so young people, they are often sort of, um, they, they become so dependent on their teachers telling them what to do and when and how all the time that they seem to just almost like be like jellyfish, like they can't do anything without some sort of structure. Um, and there was one teacher who used this fascinating phrase when I asked this question, he replied with that one that we can see at the bottom there, the resident evil of fear of failure, which is quite a phrase, isn't it? And that's something that I've thought about a lot. And obviously we named our book, Fear is the Mind Killer. And the reason for that is partly because we, we were wondering about, so what's the big idea that underpins all of the work that we've been doing around, uh, around developing self-regulation? And we just kept coming back to fear the time and time again, because fear is, is endemic. There is a resident evil of fear of failure. It's endemic among children. They're afraid of public speaking often. They're afraid of putting their hand up in class, even when they know they know the answer. There's a 1% of them that just goes like, oh, but what if you're wrong? What if you get it wrong? People might laugh. You don't want to look foolish. And so they, they just don't do it. They just stay, they, they keep their hand down. There's lots of fear around exams and the pressure and the anxiety that young people experience. There's a fear of doing anything outside of the norm, isn't there? Among, among teenagers especially, they really police one another's behavior. And among teachers as well, you know, there's a lot of fear in the profession. In research in the book, if you, if you type into Google, the two words teachers fear, but you get over 200 million hits. And there's, lo there's no shortage of newspaper articles about teachers being bullied, about people being afraid of Ofsted, about head teachers being afraid of Ofsted, of losing their jobs, of being observed and being judged to be inadequate um, and so on. And so in, in all of these cases, especially among young people, we can see how fear stops you from doing things. You know, fear keeps you in your lane and it makes you afraid even there. Um, and so we really need to, to think about this problem of self-regulated learning. People so often focus on cognition and metacognition and thinking and memory and so on. And that stuff's important. But human beings are multi-layered, you know, and that's only one aspect of us. And we've also got behaviors and we have feelings and values and experiences and so on, and memories. And underneath all of that is emotions. You know, we, we have fundamentally have an emotional response to school to learning to particular subjects to exams to to particular teachers even um, and so we need to we need to think about this problem of how do we help young people become more confident proactive effective self-regulated resilient learners all that stuff that we saw in the chat box just now we kind of have to address it on all of these levels simultaneously cognitively metacognitively behaviorally and emotionally um, and the reason that we called the book this, some people might be familiar with the film Dune, the originally a book called Dune by Frank Herbert. Brilliant book. It was made into quite a, a dodgy film at first by David Lynch, but the, the new one looks amazing. It's, been, it's gonna come out soon, I think. And in that book and in the film, there's this thing called The Litany Against Fear. I'll just read it quickly. It goes, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. And I just, it's a sensational piece of writing that, isn't it? It makes me almost feel a bit emotional just reading it now. And, um, and the thing that I like about this one of the things I like about it is that it, it reflects the fact that we're in the business of human development here. This is like human growth. It's like helping young people to grow into themselves, to develop in confidence, to, to become more fully themselves, to become their sort of their best self, if you like. People sometimes use that language. And this is so this is a process of self-actualization. 
and that's that's a lot bigger that's a lot broader than this uh, than ideas around you know like memory techniques and you know learning me methods for evaluating your writing say that stuff's important that's a narrow conception but this is that broad conception that i mentioned earlier this is about you know what it is to be human almost and this this process of of becoming um, and so that's why we that's why we use this language, this very sort of heightened emotional language. So just to give you a very brief introduction into my entry into this world, um, 10 or 12 years ago, I was working as a, as a science teacher, secondary school science teacher. And my head teacher at the time, the school had just been placed into special measures. So a school in an area of high disadvantage in the south coast of the UK. And, um, and they wanted to, as well as implementing the quick fixes that you need to get out of special measures, the head teacher was really interested in long-term cultural change. And one of the ways he wanted to do that was to, was to create a year seven taught learning to learn course, a learning skills curriculum. And it was this incredible opportunity. They gave us five lessons a week with the whole of year seven to do with whatever we wanted. And, and we had a competitive, there was a competitive selection process to help us to figure out who was going to be on this team. And so everybody on the team was really up for it. And that's something that's often overlooked in the past. In other, in other schools, in the literature, people are referred to as skeptical conscripts. You know, people who've just been sort of told, you've got a bit of spare time on your timetable, you're gonna do this learning skills stuff. There's no GCSE in it, so it's not gonna impact on the GCSE, it's not that important. We'll just staff it with whoever, they call it backfilling, don't they, in HR terms. And it doesn't work. If you're gonna do that, like you literally just don't bother because it doesn't work if you do that. But we had this team of people who were really, really up for it. So it started, as I say, with five lessons a week in year seven. And then when that cohort went into year eight the following year, the curriculum time expanded with them. So they got three lessons a week in year eight. And then again into year nine, they got five lessons a fortnight. So over three years, that cohort of young people had over 400 lessons of, of learning skills um, throughout the whole of key stage three. And so there are three sort of structural elements to this curriculum, if you like. Number one, we had these taught lessons, but as time went on, we realized that actually this needed to become something that was much more whole school. It's all well and good to teach this stuff in these isolated lessons, but unless this is infusing throughout the school and affecting how they learn in geography and history and art and French and their lives beyond the school gates, then we were missing a big trick. And so the second element was that we had embedded elements across the curriculum. So we had shared pedagogical strategies and a joined up approach to, to professional development so that the young people were experiencing a much more joined up diet of learning across the curriculum. And thirdly, we had strategies for transfer, explicit strategies for transfer, because this has often been the way that learning to learn has fallen over in the past, that, that um, things don't transfer. And that's not to say that they can't transfer at all, they can, but it doesn't happen automatically. You have to carefully manage that. And that's carefully transferring out of the learning skills classroom. And we could talk about that later if you like, and also transfer in to subject learning across the curriculum. So I realized early on that this was an incredible opportunity to do something really bold and different. And I was really keen to capture it in the most robust way possible. And so I signed up to do a PhD, which turned out to be an eight year study because we followed four cohorts of kids from year seven through to GCSE, one control cohort, the pre-learning to learn cohort, if you like, who had very similar data at entry to the school so we could compare like with like, and then three learning to learn cohorts. And the main outcome measure was how are they doing in their subject learning across the curriculum? We measured all kinds of things, but we really wanted that to be the main test. Is this helping them to learn more effectively in, in their subject learning across the piece? And we found that it did, the results were incredible. And I'll talk about them a little bit later on, but very briefly, we saw significant gains in subject learning across the curriculum from quite early on. Uh, and in particular, it was especially beneficial for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. So at GCSE, the disadvantage gap closed by over 65% from one cohort to the next. Um, and so we were very encouraged um, by the findings that we, that we saw in this study. But this was just a pilot study, and it was in a secondary school, as I say. But we've since implemented this in a whole range of contexts from early years through to adult education in universities, We've worked with schools in areas of high disadvantage and also with elite international colleges uh, abroad. We've worked in taking these ideas into workplaces. My colleague Kate has done lots of work in, in refugee education over the last few years. 
I'm currently working very intensively with an SEMH school, a school for young people with social and emotional and mental health needs. Kate is now living in the Dominican Republic and she's developing a, a new approach to education. She calls it an alternative to school rather than an alternative school, which is really rooted in these ideas. Uh, and there are many other schools beyond this. And so it seems like although we adapt these ideas into different contexts, the underarching principles, the key ideas are really applicable from, from toddlers through to teens, through to you know, octogenarians and everybody in between. Um, this is almost like a universal recipe for how to, essentially it's about how to be, there's a lot of overlap in like personal development. It's just about how to be an effective functioning human being, you know. <laughs> um, so let's get into it. The theory, um, the learning to learn paradox. So you might have uh, seen this document before. Many people are familiar with it. The Education Endowment Foundation's Teaching and Learning Toolkit which was where they did a big sort of literature review and they, they looked at the effect sizes that different practices have. And they, you can organize it by how much it costs. So you can see the pound sign rating there. The padlock rating is how secure is the evidence. And then the orange circles is, uh, is how much impact do you get? And we find that in second place in this league table, and it's a bit of a, a bit of a dodgy idea to be fair the, the whole idea of the lead table because you're not comparing like with like but setting that aside for what it's worth in second place we, we have this recognition that metacognition and self-regulation um, provide what it says underneath that red circle provide high impacts for very low cost based on extensive evidence which sounds amazing doesn't it um, and so if you click through uh, we're told that metacognition and self-regulation approaches aim to help pupils think about their own learning more explicitly, often by teaching them strategies for planning, monitoring and evaluating their learning. Um, and the EEF have got this slightly strange definition of self-regulated learning, which we can see here. They break it down into three different sub subdomains, if you like, cognition, metacognition, which they equate with learning to learn and motivation. Um, and I'm going to come into this later on because I think that there's quite a quite a number of things wrong with the way in which the EEF define these these words. And I do think this really matters. And so I want to take a little bit of a close look at that later on because you think, OK, that's interesting. Why have you chosen to define it in that way? And is that really what these words mean? Um, and that's a rhetorical question, by the way. So that's the EEF. And then we elsewhere, we have um, people who are very skeptical of these ideas about learning to learn. So just to, to give you one example, uh, there's a chap called Tom Bennett, who some of you may be aware of. He's like the behavior czar and he uh, runs the research ed conferences and he's written some books. And this is one of them called Teacher Proof, why research in education doesn't mean what it claims and what you can do about it. Um, and this was like where he was pulling together all these ideas that he saw as like fads essentially things like um, learning styles and brain gym and multiple intelligences and thinking hats and all these ideas that we've sort of filled our professional lives for, for years, which for which there's, there's, there's uh, dubious evidence. And he includes a chapter in this book called Learning to Learn to Learn to Learn, hilariously. And, and he says in this chapter, learning to learn isn't even a thing. We've been hoaxed again. The hipsters are selling snake oil on this whether they know it or not. And so again, we have what you might <laughs> call a, a monocle moment. You know, you're like, okay, really? Like either, either the EEF are right and you know, learning to learn is pretty much the most effective game in town, high impacts for very low cost based on extensive evidence, or it's total snake oil hoax, hoax uh, sold by unwitting hipsters. And so the, this is the learning to learn paradox that I'm talking about. So like, what's going on here? So let's actually look at the evidence for it. What, what do we find? So if you look at the, the research that, that underpins that claim of the, 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 of the EEF, they, that's mainly focused on meta-analyses, um, which is, as you're probably aware, is like studies of studies. And so these are like very large studies of other studies of metacognition and self-regulation uh, interventions. And as you can see down the right-hand side, the average effect size for these studies is around about between 0.5 and 0.7. And that's big as effect sizes go. I think Nahida said that, that Professor Rob Coe is coming soon. Um, Rob Coe has written that like, if, you, 
if you've got a secondary school that's got uh, like, like in old money, like 50% of kids were getting five A star to C, an effect size of 0.5 to 0.7 would, would translate to about 75% of kids getting five A's to C. So a school going up by 25% in one year saved. So that's, that's a big old effect size we're looking at here. So there's pretty consistent, robust evidence that, that, that these practices um, improve outcomes. And something that's not often recognized is that Dylan Williams' work on formative assessment is pretty much learning to learn by another name. If you look at the five key strategies that underpin formative assessment, in three of those, we're talking about eliciting evidence of learning. In other words, like, like making learning explicit, making the processes of learning explicit, activating students as learning resources for one another, activating students as owners of their own learning, like that's self-regulated learning, isn't it? And I, it's interesting that Dylan doesn't use that language, but that is very much what, what that approach is about. And there's really good evidence that that formative assessment um, leads to improved outcomes for young people. Um, and lastly, the, the learning skills curriculum, my own work, I'll just touch on this briefly. If you really want to get into this, um, you, can, you can read the book or if you want the hardcore version, my PhD is, um, is online. You can get it via my website. By the way, I forgot to mention earlier, but I have a copy of the book. And at the end of this call, there will be a magic question. And uh, if, you, if you correctly answer it, the first person to answer it in the chat box will be sent a, a copy of the book. Um, so in the book, we go into great detail about the evidence, but just to share with you like the headline findings, if you like. So this was after three years, the proportion of kids who are either hitting or exceeding target compared with the control group. So the control group is the white bars here and the, the red bars are the learning to learn group. And we can see that there were significant gains. And if you look at the bars on the right hand side, that those gains were especially pronounced among young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And if we drill down into this data and we do a subject by subject analysis, we can see that here. So if you look at English, for example, on the left hand side in the in the control cohort, the white bar there says that the, the disadvantage gap was about 30 percent the, the, between the difference between um, people premium and non people premium kids hitting or exceeding target, which is huge. It's like slightly above the national average, but not far. And in the in, in the learning to learn cohort, as you can see, in these five subjects um, where the red bar goes below the zero line, that tells us that actually after three years of learning to learn, the, the gap had closed so much that it had gone the other way. So in those five subjects, in English, math, science, art, and geography, the learning to learn in the learning to learn cohort, the pupil premium kids were outperforming non-pupil premium kids in those five subjects and not in these other subjects on the right hand side. But that's what we would expect to see, isn't it? If if this advantage was not a predictor of, of educational outcomes. We would expect to see some variation, but it would be a balanced picture. And if we combine all this data together, on average in the control cohort after three years, the, the learning to learn, uh, sorry, the, the disadvantage gap was around 25%. And in the learning to learn cohort, it was just 2%. So we closed the gap in the space of three years almost completely. And as I mentioned earlier, we saw a very, very similar pattern of results when those young people got through to GCSE. And just to share, we, we didn't only collect exam data, and this is just one, one example of the qualitative data that we collected. This was an interview with a young, with a young uh, girl, Zina, who um, later on the year nine curriculum was discontinued because they wanted to make more time for maths and English. And this was when she was in year eight going into year nine. And so she said, when you're in learning skills, you learn how to do things that you can use in other lessons and you learn how to be more confident and what you learn sticks with you and teaches you to act the same in other lessons. And then she said, I was really disappointed when I found out that we're not gonna have learning skills, she meant next year. Uh, but then I thought back to last year and I thought about everything that I have learned and how I can use that in lessons and it kind of sticks with you and then it becomes a part of you. And it's lovely that, isn't it? And it's that that's sort of what I'm talking about when I was talking about self actualization, you know, and like growing into yourself when she's using that language, it sticks with you, it becomes a part of you It becomes a part of who you are as a person. It's not just about improving exam results, although, you know, that stuff is important. And as I say, if you want to go into the detail on the evidence for this, please feel free to to dive into the book or to the PhD if you're really hardcore. Okay. 
So let's get into defining some terms and then I want to pause and give you a chance to digest and reflect and just have a little moment to have a think. There's a lot of confusion around these terms. And when I, when I talk to teachers in schools, they're not sure what, they, what these words really mean. Some people, as I was talking with Nahida recently, she was like this metacognition, it's like this polysyllabic word that some people sometimes sort of recoil away from. I remember one of the first times I heard it, my, my assistant head teacher mentioned it, but he sort of prefaced it by saying, oh, I put my anorak on at the weekend and I'm really geeky. And I did, I read and read a research paper and now I'm going to talk about metacognition. And he was sort of like discounting. He was like apologizing for the fact that he was going to use this word. So there's a, there's a bit of hesitance around this word and also confusion around what it means and what, what it, how it equates to self-regulation what the difference is between self-regulation and self-regulated learning and so on. And it's not surprising that this confusion exists within the teaching profession because it also exists within, within researchers. So there's a famous paper um, from 2008 by Dinsmore et al, where they looked at how these words are used in loads and loads of, of research papers. And they found that only in about half of the papers did the researchers even bother, bother to offer a definition and that where those definitions were provided, there are often differences as well as areas of overlap. So it's a bit of a dog's dinner, this whole situation. So let's see if we can clear it up. I think that we can actually. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the EEF, I've got this tripartite definition, cognition, metacognition, and motivation, and that they feed into this overarching umbrella term of self-regulated learning. And so what's good about this? Like there are some advantages with the EEF's definition. First of all, it makes an attempt to differentiate between metacognition and self-regulation, although I think I get it wrong. They have at least tried to, to, to distinguish the two. Secondly, it recognizes the importance of cognition because lots of things go around under the banner of metacognition, but it's got quite a specific definition. It's like cognition about cognition. So if cognition, if thoughts, if, if mental processing, if that is not the, the object of your thinking, then it's not metacognition. And so by recognizing the importance of cognition, you know, I think that that's useful. And it's also useful to have motivation in the mix because, you know, by, by its nature, self-regulated learning, you have to sort of be motivated to take part in this. You can't sort of motivate yourself to do stuff that you're not motivated to do. It's hard to do that. So motivation is important. But there are problems here. Number one, this is not how these words are, are, def are defined generally in the literature, and we'll look at that. And I think that I can provide you with some better definitions. Secondly, the focus on cognition is all well and good, but this, this model completely overlooks, in my view, the importance of emotional self-regulation, which I mentioned earlier, is completely absent from that, apart from, you know, tangentially in, in motivation, you might argue. And also the EEF used the words self-regulation and self-regulated learning interchangeably as though they are the same thing and they're not. And there's a very important distinction. So let, let's see if we can unpick this. And I think that, I, I hope that you'll find this helpful. Metacognition goes, it was coined by a guy called John Flavel, a developmental psychologist. And he said essentially that we learn to control our thinking by monitoring our knowledge and our thinking about different things, about people, and that could be about ourselves or other people, about tasks and about strategies. And Chris Watkins, who's a hero of mine, and I know uh, Nahida's a very big fan of his as well, uh, a former colleague from the Institute of Education, um, described it as, as awareness of thinking process and executive control of such processes. So both Watkins and Flavella are talking about monitoring and control, essentially. And so I think that put simply, metacognition is monitoring and controlling your thought processes. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? So let's park that for now, and we'll move on to self-regulation. We know most of what we know about self-regulation from the work of, of Banjora in the, in the 70s and 80s. And, um, and he talked about this is a process of influencing the external environment through our emotions and behaviours. And so that's interesting that in Dinsmore et al, in that paper that I mentioned earlier, they recognize that while metacognition has got a cognitive orientation, this is about what's about monitoring and controlling what's going on in your head. Self-regulation is more about human action. It's about emotions and behaviors, and it's about how we interact with the external world. So put simply, I would say that self-regulation is monitoring and controlling your feelings and your behaviors. 
and feelings could be physical feelings as well as emotional feelings and that's an important thing to recognize and when we do the session on self-regulation later in this in this in the summer term we'll spend a lot of time thinking about our bodies and our, how our nervous system doesn't it doesn't stop at the neck our nervous system goes throughout our whole body and often when young people are feeling afraid or nervous or excited or whatever they don't just think it they feel it you feel it in your chest you feel it in your body their legs are really jittery their you know fidgety fingers and all that stuff so we need to control our physical feelings as well as our emotional feelings okay and self-regulated learning so Shunk, Dale Shunk has written, is very well regarded in this field, um, says that self-regulated learning is the process by which cognitions and behaviours are oriented towards learning goals. So if you think back to self-regulation is about emotions and behaviours, metacognition is about cognition, and this is about the application of those ideas to learning goals. And in an earlier paper, Shunk and Ertma said basically the same thing, that this is about thoughts, feelings and actions, that are about one's learning. And so if you think about it, self-regulated learning is the application of metacognition and self-regulation to learning. Because if you think about it, like metacognition is huge, right? Monitoring and controlling your thought processes. You can think about anything, can't you? You can think about politics or your cat or your diet. You can think about loads of stuff that's not just about learning. And, and likewise, with self-regulation, your feelings and behaviors go uh, actually are vast. And this is not all about learning. And so self-regulated learning is the application of these ideas to learning. And so that, I think, is a succinct explanation and a more accurate and helpful, I believe, uh, explanation of what these words mean, how they differ and how they overlap. And you might be thinking, ah, but the EEF model had motivation in it. Where's motivation gone? And you've got a good point. Um, and so the, the, but, but there's, it's not, there's not only motivation that's missing here. Like, this is just a model. And like all models, it's a simplification of reality because you know, reality is, is vast and interconnected. Um, but there are a number of, of sort of enabling factors that we can think about as teachers. And motivation is one of them, but also self-efficacy is one. Like, do, do they believe, do young people believe that they can be, you know, learn to regulate their own learning? Um, oracy is absolutely key here, uh, the ability to verbalize and articulate your thoughts, feelings and emotions and so on. Agency is massive, like choice has to be written into this by its nature. You know, you like <laughs> you can't you can't um, self like ask young people to self regulate if, if they don't have any choice. That choice absolutely has to be in there. And knowledge as well is an enabling factor. And so I mean, you could argue that there are other things as well, but we can see that this model sort of is situated within this wider nexus, if you like, of these enabling factors. But I think that essentially, if we're wanting to just focus on these three key ideas, this is a helpful way to think about how they interact. Okay, um, that is the end of that first part of this talk. Um, we're gonna pause now and I'm gonna, um, just ask you to contribute some thoughts to the to the chat box. I'll give you three minutes to start with. This might last for a bit longer. Please number your responses um, so that we know which statement you're responding to. Um, and I don't know if it's possible. I think that we can call upon people from, from what I can tell from the way this Zoom call is called up. Um, we might, if, if, there's a, if there's a particular point that um, somebody said that, I, that I'd like to hear more about, we might ask you to unmute and, uh, and to share your thinking. So we'll give you a couple of minutes. Statement one, the frog model. Some people refer to this as a frog model because it sort of looks a bit froggy. The frog model of, of self-regulated learning makes more sense than the EF definition. Do you agree or disagree? What do you think about that? Number two, learning to learn has had its day. There are many people who think this. Uh, we just need to teach knowledge. And, and you know and and then critical thinking and creativity and so on will sort of emerge from from a rich knowledge rich curriculum so let's stop talking about learning to learn and focus on knowledge and um, that's the second one and the third one is we don't need to know all this theory we're busy teachers you know we're at the end of a busy busy year and um, just give us the practical strategies why are we why are we bothering with all this theory nonsense okay there are your three talking points um, I will open up the chat box on my screen. I'll give you a few minutes to um, have a think and make some responses. <laughs> Go. 
Glad to hear that, Joe. That's interesting. So Nahida, did you ask that question about self-efficacy before I mentioned self-efficacy? Yes, I did. Right. Thank you. Great stuff. I, pre I anticipated your question. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, um, Mourned K. Uh, learning to learn helps you acquire knowledge. It does. And that's what's, what's really interesting is like what's underneath it all. It's like an onion. It's like in order to acquire knowledge, you need to sort of have skills. You know, there are like you can be a skilled learner, aren't you? Can't you? you can be um, sophisticated at it. And then underneath those skills, there's also knowledge again, isn't there? There's like the knowledge of how to have an effective conversation. There's knowledge about how to organize your time and resources and so on. So it's like this like, um, really fascinating puzzle, like what's at the bottom of it? And I, th I think that at the bottom of it is, is you know, the, the human being and their emotional relationship um, to, to their learning. But uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating point. Interesting point from Ben Rooney, James. Oh yeah, thank you. What do we remove from the curriculum in order to make space for this? Yeah. I'd love to answer this, but it's your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, so in in uh, at, at Sea View, where where we piloted this, we off the top of my head, I can't remember, but it was something like we had one lesson from French, one from humanities, I think one from art, one from science, and oh no no no, and and we had ICT and PSHE were sort of rolled into it, so we were expected to deliver. Um, aspects of the, the, the PSHE curriculum. And we also were using computers. And so we took a lesson from, from IT. Um, and, but, but there's a bold step to take here. You know, like, like when people hear five lessons a, a week, they go, their, their jaws often hit the floor and they go, whoa, that's a lot of time. <laughs> you know, we're, we're like, taking, them, taking them away from subject learning. But remember that, in, you know, in this, in this study at least, um, in subsequent measures of subject learning, they learned a lot more in less time. And so when, when we went, when, when that curriculum time expanded into years eight and nine, Kate and I went to the meetings with all the other heads of department, expecting to have a battle on our hands. And we found that we were just pushing at an open door because they, they could see the difference in the kids in their lessons. They could see the difference on their spreadsheets as well. And they were like, we can see that actually these kids are more switched on they're more able to learn more effectively when they come into our lessons. And so they were quite willing to give up that, that lesson time. Um, but it's, it takes courageous leadership um, to, to, to carve out that time in the curriculum. I'm currently working with a school that's carved out even more time. They're, they're doing about 33% of the, about one third of the time. What were you gonna add to that question, Nahida? Just to say that if you keep coming back to the theory, and, the, and then asking teachers how they're applying it, it becomes something that they start doing independently. So they start making those links and behave, you know, promoting metacognition and self-regulation quite uh, intuitively part of their practice. And they, it's, you know, it's iterative, so it changes and they adapt it the deeper the understanding is. So at Raffin, it's not about making extra time for it, it's just very much part and parcel of how we do it. So it's, I think people have said that as well in the chat. Mm, yeah, yeah, thank you. There's some great comments here. I'll just give people a few more minutes to, to, to have a think, but also to read one another's comments. Yeah, Mark makes a good point here. So Mark, Mark said, I don't think space has to be removed if the process is immersed within the existing curriculum. And that's so, so since people have been first talking about this, ever since the sort of 70s, when it really gained ground, 
Um, there's been this sort of ongoing debate within the learning to learn community. Can you teach this stuff explicitly? Should you teach it explicitly and discreetly? Or should it be infused throughout everything that we do? And most people seem to seem to think that it should be infused throughout everything that we do. And that's true in theory. The, the, the unfortunate problem with that idea is that it doesn't happen in practice um, with the best will in the world. Like partly because not all teachers buy into this. There was a fascinating study that was done about like teachers' conceptions of learning to learn. And lots of teachers, around about one third, um, have a broad conception of learning to learn. The, the, the idea that I talk about it in terms of self-actualization. And two thirds of teachers think about it more in terms of like study skills and revision techniques and exam techniques and so on. And so they have a narrow conception. And even where they, where, where, where people have a broad conception of learning to learn, they find that they don't have time to, to teach it within the existing curriculum because there's so much to cover. And I used to find that as a science teacher, you know, there's nobody that's more committed to this stuff than I am. And I couldn't really find much, much time to, to address this agenda in my subject teaching. So you would, you would have to rethink how much curriculum content there is to cover in order to, in order to, really do it justice but I think that you essentially need to do both I do think that you need to have discrete lessons and you have to have it infused across the curriculum and you have to have transfer going on and um, you basically just sort of throw the kitchen sink at, at the problem is, is my response to that that you sort of need to do all of it Yeah, there's a good question there from Maxine. Nahida, would it be okay to save the chat file and then share it with people afterwards? Yes, I'm going to do that. Definitely. Thank you. This is great. Okay, um, we're going to press on because I want to, you know, get through everything. Um, so please feel free to carry, like, carry on chatting among yourselves in the chat box. We're going to move into practice now. So let's get into this narrow versus broad thing. I've sort of covered this a bit, but again, I don't, I don't want to be this, this, this to be like a EEF bashing uh, session. They do lots of very, very good, valuable work. Um, but I think that, that, that um, you could argue that the version of, of the, the definition of metacognition that they offer is quite a narrow definition that focuses on like strengths and weaknesses and strategies. So in, that, in the guidance that we can see there, the, the metacognition and self-regulated learning guidance. There's like a vignette. There's a little the, the picture painting of a, a word painting of a girl called Freya who's struggling with a maths, uh, sorry, with a spelling test. And then she goes away and she uses some mnemonic strategies to help her remember how to spell these words. And then lo and behold, you know, she does better in her in her spelling test the following week. And this is a good idea. You know, we want young people to be able to spell if, effectively, and it's it's good stuff but it's narrow you know this is a narrow conception and if we contrast this to what Flavel himself wrote about at the start of this process back in the 70s he wrote the ideas currently brewing in this area could someday be parlayed into I love that word parlayed like he's talking pirates parlayed into a method of teaching children and adults to make wise and thoughtful life decisions as well as how to learn more effectively in formal settings um, and so to me I think that, that it's, it's about this wider conception. I'm not saying that the narrow version isn't worth our attention, it absolutely is. But I think that we're missing a huge trick if we're not recognizing that we're in the business here of helping young people become you know, their fullest self to become uh, effective, uh, organized, confident, proactive, empathic. You know, There are many dimensions to this. It's not just about spelling. Important though spelling is. So um, someone else who's really, who's really key in this is Bob Zimmerman, who's written a lot, and he gives this, I'll just read this out, a definition of self-regulated learning. He says, these learners are proactive in their efforts to learn. I talk about this all the time with my son, who's, you know, does pretty well at school, but he's reactive, you know, he, like, he does his homework when he's told, but he would never dream of opening the revision guide or reading around the subject, say, he wouldn't be proactive. And but so self-regulated learners are proactive in their efforts to learn rather than reactive. They're aware of their strengths and limitations uh, because they're guided by personally set goals. That's a really important thing that goal setting is done by the kids rather than having goals set for them, which we so often do as teachers and task related strategies. 
They monitor their behavior over time in terms of their goals and they self-reflect. And that's an important thing, self-reflect. So they're doing this under their own steam. They are habitually reflective at this point. This enhances their self-satisfaction and their motivation to continue to improve. And so at the end of this paragraph, we sort of, we're in like a virtuous cycle now, aren't we? Where like, think like kids are just like feeling great about themselves, learning under their own steam and that makes them want to do it more and more. And this is wonderful, isn't it? Like, how do we get to this point where young people, and we would, like, we would want this for every young person and adult, wouldn't we, to, to, to be like this? Um, and so let's think about how we, get, how we get there, you know, and we can get there. It's absolutely doable. Um, and so I'm going to share with you two strategies in each of these four headings. Um, so the first one is about metacognition. And essentially, this isn't so much of a strategy as like a mindset. And it's about recognizing that that metacognition is essentially about focusing on the how of learning as well as the what of learning. So it's about taking the invisible cognitive processes of learning and making them visible and therefore learnable. So if you think about that kid who just nails it, they may be quite a quiet kid who doesn't speak very much, but they just everything that they need to learn out of a lesson, they just learn and it sticks. You know, but that's not a passive process. It's not, they're, they're not, it's not just drifting into their ears and sticking, like they're doing something in there. <laughs> so what are they doing? And can we lift the lid on that? Um, and so it's about taking those implicit, tacit, like invisible, unspoken processes of learning and bringing them out into the light, making them visible, tangible, and therefore learnable. And in, in terms of classroom practice, that means that we have to focus on the how of learning as well as the what. And there's an important balance to be struck here. Some people have gone too far in the, in the direction of the how. I would argue that the knowledge rich curriculum and the traditionalist mindset that's so prevalent at the moment is too far in the favor of the what, but we need to figure out what, where the balance is. And that's gonna be different for different teachers and for different schools at different points in time. So there's no one answer to that question. Um, and it's, a, it's essentially about like, talking about learning, thinking about it, talking about it, writing about it. And it's asking questions like, you know, at the end of a lesson, you do what, you know, the word plenary has gone a bit out of fashion now, hasn't it? But, you know, if, we, if we're doing some sort of a check on what they've learned in a lesson, you also ask, like, how did you learn that? What were you actually doing when you learned that thing? What were you doing just at that moment? Was it because you were talking about it? Did, we read, did you read it? Did you look it up? Were you reading over previous notes that you've previously written, but suddenly something clicked? Did you ask a question? And then the answer just appeared in your head before anybody had even answered it, you know? Um, what were you doing? And this is there's this idea called transfer plenaries. We used to do this all the time. That when I spoke earlier about transfer out of the learning skills classroom. And that's like, whatever it is that you're doing today, whether you're making a list or making a stall for the Christmas market or build, growing an allotment, we would ask like, okay, stop what you're doing. How might this help you in French? What we're doing today, how might this help you in French? And we don't know how to answer that question, but kids were really able to make those connections or how might it help you to, to do better in, in the playground? How might it help you to do better in your life outside of school? How might it help you get on better with your siblings and so on? So we're helping them to become habitually reflective, like I said before. And it, again, it's all about monitoring and control. By asking these questions, you, you shine a light, you notice stuff. And when you notice and pay attention to these, to these processes, then you learn where the levers are, or rather as a kid, that, then they learn where the levers are. They learn how to control their thinking uh, next time around. So the, the how of learning is huge. And as a practical application of that, think alouds are a really good idea, which is, it just does what it says on the tin really thinking out loud so that that quiet kid who's doing stuff in their head what are they doing get them in a pair and get them to articulate what they're doing as they're solving a maths problem or as they're translating a paragraph of spanish say um and so to, to teach them how to do this firstly the teacher models it so when you're working through a problem or reading a complex text so you might use the visualizer say and then the students practice it. And you can do a low tech version with like, you know, pencil and a paper, or there's a really good iPad app. If you're a school where, where iPads are around, there's an app called Explain Everything, which is great. So let's say that the kids are, are solving a, a maths puzzle. So as well as seeing what they're writing, they're also verbalizing it. And then the app is recording what they're saying as well. So as a teacher, when you play that back, you know, if they've made a problem, if they've made a mistake in their, in their logic as they work through this math puzzle, you might not be able to see it on the page, but if you're listening to what they're saying, then you can get an insight into what's going on in their head. 
So that's a really good idea. And this is really useful for teachers because it allows us to see inside the teachers, the, 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 the students' minds, but it's really very useful for the students themselves, even to just hear, so when you're articulating your thinking, there's another part of your mind that's listening to what's going on, you know? So they're sort of like becoming, like, engaging in this metacognitive, like internal dialogue with themselves. So it's really powerful, think aloud, it's very, very simple to do. Self-regulation, this is about emotions and it's really about checking in, you know, like checking in with yourself and just like asking your kids as they come into a lesson, how are you today? You know, how are you? And being like making it your job at the start of a lesson to, to paying attention to that. And if they're stressed out, if, if there's just been some beef in the corridor at break time or they've got friendship issues or whatever it might be, or if they're just totally drenched because they just, you know, like missed the bus and had to walk to school in the rain, you know, whatever it is, like they might be dysregulated and they might not be in a place where they are able to access all their cognitive strategies and so on. And so they might need to take some sort of action to get back in the zone. And young people can learn how to do this. This is a really key part of self-regulation. And we'll get into all this in the next session uh, in June. Um, but essentially there's three sort of manual override levers I think that we have, uh, the mind, the body and the breath. And so if, for example, if it's like, let's say you've got like, a kid's got a maths lesson and they, they, they always tell themselves I'm rubbish at maths. I'm never going to get any better at maths and so on. A mind response might be like just to notice that, just like just notice that and don't identify it. Don't think I am rubbish at maths, but you just hear, oh, I'm, pl my, I'm playing that script again. My mind, something in my mind is telling me I'm rubbish at maths. Isn't that interesting? So they put some distance between them and the thought, and then they could maybe try some positive self-talk or some sort of a visualization thing or whatever it might be, something to do with what's going on in their mind. Breathing is hugely powerful, um, but people often say things like, uh, oh, take a deep breath. You know, just take a deep breath, you'll be fine. And that's actually not really that good advice, like because one breath isn't really going to do much. But you can do a breathing exercise, like taking smooth breaths is really interesting. There's this thing called HRV, heart rate variation. If you're not familiar with this, look it up. It's really fascinating. And lots of like very high level business coaches use it with the high, high, up, the high earning, you know, multimillionaire investors where they're like you need to be able to perform in a certain meeting how can you get yourself into that peak state and they do really smooth breathing so if you if you never listen to your breath it's sort of jerky your breath isn't smooth it sort of goes it sort of goes a bit like that but you can make it smooth with practice and with smooth breathing that controls the heart rate it can, controls the, the flow of blood to your brain and you can get yourself into a peak state with like five or ten really smooth breaths you can totally change your physical um your state of physiology which is amazing um or you can do like long out breaths Ooh, that's really good so we do that at night time before you before you go to sleep you might notice you do you often do a really long out breath and you do that when you feel safe right when you feel safe enough to go to sleep evolutionarily we know that you're not going to get eaten by a tiger right so you do a big out breath and it's sort of like a symbol a signal to your body that it, you're safe that you're okay here and so doing a few short in breaths and then hold it and then do a really long out breath a few of those can really calm you down or the other you can do you can do it the other way around you can do short um short out breaths and long in breaths and that can that can wake you up a little bit uh, and the body as well, you know, if somebody's nervous about something, you can, you know, you can stretch out if you've got butterflies, you can physically move so that you can't feel them anymore. Or if you're tense and you've got your, if, you know, if a kid's got their jaw clenched or whatever it is, just like loosen your jaw, shake it out, you know, just like be in your body. And what's cool about all of these three things is that they bring you into the moment. They bring you into the now, don't they? Mind, body, breath. It's all about now, 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 because so much of the problems that we see, it's like people worrying about stuff that's in the future or chewing over stuff that's happened in the past. And very rarely are you in any danger in the current moment. And so those manual override levers, essentially, they all are about bringing you back into the moment where you're basically fine, <laughs> you're safe and it's, everything's OK. Um, and so check in and take action. That's a really good thing to do. And we'll get into that in more detail in the next session. And this is amazing self-regulation this is more about behaviors there's this guy called the scary guy i don't know if you've seen this there's an episode of teachers tv if you type in tinyurl.com forward slash scary guy one two three 
um, you'll get a shortcut to this to this video on YouTube. It's brilliant, and he's like you can see him. He's got this like tattooed face and this like contorted sort of. He looks like this hateful figure, but he became this really. He had this like epiphany in his life, and he was like, "What have I become?" And he became this like motivational speaker who goes around to young people to schools and in particular helps kids to stop bullying one another and to stop calling each other names. And he does this thing called the seven day challenge where you're not allowed to say a negative word about another human being for seven days and seven nights. <laughs> He's got this lovely phrase. He says, if you think you're tough, try that. That is tough. That's really tough. And it is so fascinating to do this. We used to do this every, every uh, anti-bullying week in November. And then, um, uh, so like little little tiny little year sevens who wouldn't say boo to a goose they they were crumbling after a day they're like i can't get through a day without calling my brother or sister a name you know it's or my friends or whatever or somebody in the somebody on the street it's absolutely fascinating and then we got them to journal it and so they were writing strategies and they were like okay so i know that my brother now knows that i'm doing this challenge and he's going to try and wind me up. And so I'm going to be really nice to him beforehand. I'm just going to say, oh, your hair looks really nice today. Or I'm going to the kitchen. Can I get you a drink or something? And they're like, oh, and it really freaks people out because you're like, you kill them with kindness sort of thing. It's, I just, I super recommend this. And we referred back to it so many times throughout the year. Uh, it's brilliant. So the seven day challenge and watch that scary guy thing and watch it with the kids. Um, okay, Oracy. This was this is Neil Mercer, who's my PhD supervisor, who's done loads of work on uh, on talk rules and how to how to speak and listen together effectively, and some work that he did way back in the eighties now was was around looking at how young people speak and listen in classrooms around computers at the time because there weren't enough for there to be one for everyone for every kid to have one, and so they were like, how do kids interact around computers? And they recorded loads of kids speaking in groups in classrooms. And they, they coded the talk and they came up with these three categories, disputational talk, which, you know, as the name suggests, is like, yes, it is. No, it's not. It's a sort of competitive type talk, um, but they're not really engaging with one another in a critical level. And we see lots and lots of disputational talk um, in, in classrooms and in the wider society. We see it in, in, you know, in interviews with people and they're like, oh, you need to hit them with like hard hitting questions or you know, a prime minister's questions say, and it might make for if entertaining, you know, political theater, but it's not effective. You never get to the bottom of it. You never find out what's going on. You know, person A says, we've got a recruitment crisis in nursing. We've got fewer nurses than ever before. And person B goes, no, we've not. We've got record numbers of nurses. And you go, well, this is ridiculous. Like how many nurses are there? Is it gone up or down? But you never find out, do you? You never get to the bottom of it. So disputational talk is really unhelpful. Then we've got cumulative talk where the talk just sort of stacks up. Um, and it's essentially where the kids are wait waiting for the other person to stop talking so that they can say their thing. And this can be useful when we're pooling ideas, but again, they're not really critically engaging with one another. And when the, when the researchers were coding all of these conversations, they were like, this is quite depressing. We're not seeing much productive talk, but then they started to see little snippets and snatches of what they described as exploratory talk or in the States, um, they would describe it as accountable talk. And, um, and this is where we see things like this, um, where people share what they know with one another, where, where everybody's asked to contribute, where they give reasons for what they say to one another, where they pay attention and they try to think of good ideas, where they work towards agreement. That's really powerful. So and we build on one another's ideas and so on. And so a way to do this, so to come up with a set of ground rules, I often used to use a thing called the hat method because this anonymizes the process. Is it, rather than imposing this from on high, you kind of have to go through a process of, get, of the kids coming up with a set of ground rules themselves. And you, you can do it in a, in a, a lesson easily at secondary. If you're, if you're um, working with younger children, there's some fantastic resources on this website, on the University of Cambridge Thinking Together website. There's some brilliant resources for teachers. And there's a sequence of three lessons that Lynn Dawes wrote uh, for helping young, younger children to, to develop a set, of, a set of ground rules like this. But with the hat method, I would essentially ask like, what's it like when, to, when, when a group talk goes really well? What's that like? And they go, they say things like, oh, I, my voice is listened to. People really, people really pay attention. Like my voice means something. People don't talk over each other and so on. 
Um, and then you do this, so you come up with a list of like good group talk and then you do the same thing for like, what's it like when group talk goes badly? And they each write down some responses on a strip of paper, stick it in the hat and that anonymizes the process. Cause you know, like a kid might not want to put their hand up in a lesson and say, oh, I don't like it when people talk over me or something. So uh, that just anonymizes the process. You compile them into two lists next to each other on the whiteboard. Here's a list of bad talk. Here's a list of what good talk looks like. And then ask the kids to come up with a set of five to seven rules that, that say like, this is, we're going to make it so that all that good stuff does happen and all that bad stuff doesn't happen. And like I say, they, they usually come up with something that looks pretty much like this. And the teacher can get involved in this as well. But as I say, get the kids to be involved in this. As a, as a classroom teacher, this is the most transformational thing that I ever did. It absolutely transformed. Like, lots, lots of people don't like group work, do they? Because group work can go badly. If you don't teach kids how to interact effectively in groups, it can go really pear-shaped really quickly. One kid does all the work, one kid just slacks off and does nothing. But when you set up these ground rules, all of a sudden they're, they're all like aware. And what's cool about ground rules is that they are inherently metacognitive. It means that the kids are reflecting on the talk as it's happening. And so you come up with a set of ground rules. I used to get all the kids to physically sign their name onto it. And I would put copies of it. Sometimes I would have a laminated one on every desk or I'd have a big one on every wall of the classroom so that wherever you are in the classroom, you can see a set of these ground rules just by flicking your eye towards the desk or flicking your eye towards the wall so that they're everywhere. Um, it's absolutely transformational and the quality of talk just improves hugely. So I heartily recommend that. And the second thing with regard to oracy is mixing up the groups. So sometimes kids find it hard when they're putting when they're when they're putting a seating plan, and often they're putting seating plans with the explicit aim that they're not sitting with their friends, right? So that they don't talk off task. But then if you ask a kid, you know, what's it like when you're asked to talk to your table partner, they often say it's actually quite hard. Like we, we can maybe come up with a, a sentence or two to say, but then it's awkward. I don't really know them very well. Or maybe the one of them is like, oh, that one, that kid's really popular. And I'm not really quite seen as being quite so popular. And so they don't really want to talk to me that much, you know, or maybe one of them secretly like fancies the other one, whatever. Like, there's, there's a whole range of reasons why it might be that kids aren't able to have a productive conversation with another kid. So we would start by saying like, you can sit in a pair of your choosing. You can sit with your friend at the start of the year because we want to, to learn how to have those really high level exploratory conversations in a pair of your choosing. And then in the second week or in the second half term, however, over what time frame you want to do this, you introduce a third person. So, and already the feathers start to fly because three is a lot more complicated, isn't it? In a pair, you've only got one relationship, A, B. When you've got three people in a, in, a in a conversation, you've got three relationships, you've got A, B, A, C, and B, C. And when you introduce a fourth person, all of a sudden there are six relationships. So it, it makes it a lot more complicated. So we'll go through that process of increasing the group size where the students choose who they're with. And then we'll repeat that cycle, but with the teachers choosing. And we make this really explicit to the kids that this is what we're doing. And we say, by the end of this process, you will be able to have a really high level productive conversation with anyone that you're in a group with of any group size and the kids really liked this when we asked them to write in their learning journals or when I interviewed them for my PhD they often said we really liked the fact that you made us we, we that, like, nudged them out of the apparent safety of their friendship groups or what they're used to so they were mixing with one another and they they really really liked it and so much powerful stuff comes out of this. That girl, Zina, who we saw earlier, she, she wrote in her learning journal about how um, she was now helping a boy who used to bully her. She was, putting, she was putting a seating plan with him in maths. And instead of asking the teacher, actually, can I not sit with him? Because there's been a problem. She was helping him with his maths. And that was hugely empowering for her to be able to be in that position. And she wrote about it really in quite a touching way. So I really recommend that mixing up the groups in a systematic way in that manner um questioning next um self-regulated learning so this is this is thinking about self-regulated learning as a whole um thinking about these three sort of areas of metacognition self-regulation and self-regulated learning here are just some examples of the kinds of questions that you might ask i'm not going to read these out i'll just give you a second to glance down the screen
and there are many more examples. These these examples are all in the book, and there's um there are blogs on the Rethinking Ed website where you can where you can access this stuff as well. Um, let's move on to self regulation of feelings. Here are some examples of the kinds of questions that you can ask. You can see how those those two ideas of monitoring and control really run throughout all of these questions. It's mostly just noticing stuff. What's it feel like? Next is uh, monitoring and controlling behaviors. And so these ones are more about control, aren't they? The emotional ones are more about like noticing your feelings. Uh, the, the, the monitoring and controlling behaviors one is more about controlling your behaviors. And then lastly, here are some examples of, of um, self-regulated learning itself. And a large part of this is about like the vocabulary, you know, it's about like helping them develop a vocabulary and a repertoire for, 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 dis for describing themselves as learners. And it's just basic teaching practice, you know, like sometimes people dismiss this stuff as progressive, like woolly mindedness, but actually the way that we teach this stuff is really quite traditional, you know, it's a bit like, you know, if you're going to teach a unit on electricity, at some point you come up with quite early on in that process you come up with a set of keywords don't you you like here are the key words that we need to, you need to be able to talk about current and voltage and power packs and bulbs and what have you switches um and it's just like the same if you want them to learn how to get better at learning stuff through asking these kinds of questions you're you're essentially asking them to to develop their vocabulary around learning itself so that they can you know just become more articulate in this domain as well so you could argue that this is like you know progressive ends through traditional means you know we, this is traditional pedagogy we model this stuff we give them opportunities to practice it we give them feedback on it you know it's pretty traditional pedagogy when you think about it questioning and the last one is the weekly review i absolutely love this and if i said that if, if i had to say that if you take one thing away from this from this um session do weekly reviews because this is where it all comes together and again it's this sort of like janus faced um, process monitoring looking back at the previous week and and looking forward the controlling bit what's coming up what what might we do differently this week i'll just give you a, a moment to glance down the screen And it doesn't have to be, this can be done as a discussion. So it could just be like, have a chat with the person on your, on your table. And that's probably enough. You know, it's more important that it's happening in their heads than in a book, but you might use a, a learning journal or it could be a homework task that you set. Um, but I think the discussion is, is you know, it's quicker. It takes, it takes less time. Um, and that's the main thing. You know, they don't need to necessarily write it down. It doesn't, it's not an accountability thing. Okay. So here's some talking points. Um, again, please begin your number your responses. I understand that metacognition is thinking about thinking, but I don't see how this helps me teach my difficult year nines or year fives or whatever it is on a Friday afternoon. Um, Self-regulation is about monitoring and controlling your feelings, but I am not in the business of controlling my students' feelings. I'm a teacher, not a therapist. That's the second one. And... This is all well and good, but uh, I can't find time for this in lessons. There's just so much to cover. There are your three provocative statements. And this, by the way, is another oracy strategy. Lynn Dawes, who's Neil Mercer's wife, 
has written some brilliant books about talking points. And like we talk about questioning all the time, don't we, as, as teachers? But actually, if you just take the question mark off some off a sentence and stick a full stop at the end, you get a very different type of response from the kids. So talking points are great. So um, let me let me un unmask the. Uh, Where's my chat box gone? I'll give you a few moments to have a think. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I mean, that second one, it is interesting. I, I do think that teachers feel out of their comfort zones um, talking with, with children about their feelings. Um, maybe, I'm not sure whether this is my own prejudice or not, but that might be the case more at secondary than at primary. Because at primary, because you're with the kids for so much more, there's much more of a pastoral element to your role, isn't there? As a science teacher, you know, I sort of definitely used to think that my job is to teach science and that, you know, the kids' feelings didn't really come into it. Thank you. Okay, um, I've got an eye on the on the time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna press on with the with the final bit of this session. Uh, please feel free to continue to, to, to chat away in the chat box. Um, so I want to I want to end by talking about implementation science, which is my uh, current obsession. And it's really the way that it fits in with this is that this is really about self-regulated leadership because we need to model this. If we want the young people to self-regulate, there's three levels to this. We need to we need to regulate ourselves as individual teachers, but also as an organization the school itself needs to be sort of taking its own pulse and listening to what's going on and responding and so on and regulating itself. So I'm going to talk about two key ideas and I'll share with you this tool, Steps to Success. So there's a really good quote by Thompson and William who say that even in the simplest intervention, we see extraordinary complexity with many components, some of which will be more effective than others. Without a strong theory of action for any given intervention, there is a danger that modifications of the intervention leave out or neutralize the effects of the positive, the most powerful component. So essentially, there's two key ideas here. Number one, this idea that of complex interventions, and number two, this idea of a theory of action. So I'll just go through each briefly. Very simply, a complex intervention is an intervention with several interacting elements. And the reason that I'm talking about this is because I said, you know, I said earlier about how self-regulated learners, this, there's, there's like many dimensions to this. It's emotional, behavioral, cognitive, metacognitive. And we need to address this, this problem with a, with, a, with, a, with a solution that reflects that complexity. Um, and so it's an intervention with several interacting elements. And it's sort of based on the idea of marginal gains theory, this idea that the individual, the, the gains that you get from any individual element stack up and interact, and you get this effect size that's greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and this, this thinking of, around complex interventions is widely used in other fields. So in medicine, for example, there's this, there's this idea of multimodal analgesia, whereby instead of just giving somebody morphine, who's like had an operation and morphine's an effective painkiller, actually, if you let them have top up morphine if they want, but also you use preemptive analgesia at the site of the incision where the surgery is going to be, 
and you use local anesthetics afterwards as well as systemic anesthetics and you give them a massage and you use heat and cold therapy and electro stimulation and you know even play music give them a window to look out of all of these things have been found to reduce pain and lo and behold you get better pain relief it's cost less money because you use less drugs they get out of bed quicker so you turn over the the, the bed quicker and it's like a win-win-win they recover quicker um, but it's almost entirely absent from from our thinking in in education, where we're just constantly looking at, at silver bullets. Um, uh, sorry, I did say I was going to stop bashing the EF, didn't I? But I'm going to do one more. The, <laughs> the, the, the randomized controlled trials that they're running at, at great expense. So many of those look at individual like single variable interventions they look at like one of them is about texting parents like is texting parents the thing that makes a difference we'll get 50 schools to do that and 50 schools to not do it and we'll crunch the numbers over two years or is it daily singing one of them is about daily singing is that the thing that makes the difference and it's and it's nearly all measured in terms of whether it improves english and maths and it's just mad like what if it's a combination of, of texting and singing and doing homework in this particular way and you know doing some well-being stuff and maybe a bit of self-regulation in, involved so it's this is rare in education and i think that there are huge gains to be made if we can if we can get on board with this thinking that's widespread as you can see that that definition comes from the medical research council um, and this idea of thinking is widespread in medicine, in social care, in mental health, absent from education. OK, so that's complex interventions. A theory of action, very simply, is, a, is a, a, a theory that sets out the mechanisms by which the improvements that you want to see will be achieved. So if you're wanting your kids to become self-regulated, you need to think, like, how are we going to get there? OK, and a really good phrase to use is when we implement X, Y will happen because Z. And so um, you can apply that sentence to each element of the complex intervention or to the complex intervention as a whole. Um, and I'll go through an example of what that looks like now. So in terms of the learning skills curriculum at Seaview, we had those, those structural elements that I mentioned earlier, taught lessons, embedded stuff, and strategies for transfer. And then we had a whole bunch of things that we were doing under each of these three headings of RC, metacognition, and self-regulation. And I'll just give you one example of a theory of action statement from each uh, of these domains. And I'm not going to read it out. I'll just let, let you read it for yourself. And here's talk rules. One for metacognition. So you can see it's just a formula. You can apply that to any of the individual elements within your within your uh, complex intervention. And then you can also apply it to the complex intervention as a whole. And so this would be an example of a statement that we could use with regard to a learning skills curriculum. And you could you could you know, you could challenge that. You could say, well, it's not just about achieving higher grades. That's sort of, we, we focused on that for a strategic reason, really, because if it doesn't improve grades, A, it's probably not working very well. <laughs> like if you're trying to help the kids to get better at learning stuff and their grades aren't going up, then maybe it's not doing what you think it's doing. Um, but also if it doesn't improve grades, then no one's going to do it. <laughs> so we, we focused on that for strategic reasons, but you might argue that there are other, there are other worthy goals. But anyway, you get the idea of a theory of action. So I really recommend that if you're thinking about taking some of these ideas that I've talked about today and, and, and implementing them, I think it's a good idea to, to, to go through this very careful process of thinking about a complex intervention. What, can, what different elements can I pull together? And can I write a theory of action for each element of that theory of action, as, of, of that intervention, I beg your pardon, and for the intervention as a whole? Uh, and you might need to consult the literature at this point. What is known about effective practice in this area? What gaps exist? Um, yeah, so I really recommend that you that you think about it at that theoretical level before you start doing anything, because then you're on you're on solid foundations. Okay, we've just got time, I think, to share with you. Um, it's a perfect time in steps to success. 
my favorite of, of all of the tools that I've been working with recently in, in terms of implementation science. This is something that comes from uh, some researchers in the States called Hall and Horde, and it's part of a wider approach to implementation that's called the CBAM model, concerns-based adoption. But anyway, this is just one element of what they do. And they call, they, they've got a horrible name for this. They call it innovation configurations, <laughs> but um, that's awful. So I call it steps to success. So um, essentially you've got five iterations, right? It's like a five point scale that you're going to make. And you start with the target level. So this is, for example, let, let's say that you've got a teacher who wants to, be, to, wants to become a dialogic teacher. They, they want spoken language to be at the beating heart of, of teaching and learning in their classroom. So you start with the target level. Again, I'm not gonna read through these because X is not time, but B, you don't wanna hear my voice. Here's some examples of what you might decide. I'm not saying this is necessarily best practice. This is just an example of what you might wanna see in the target level. And it's good to do that. You want to start with the end in mind, because as teachers, we often start with the to-do list, don't we? We want to start with like, what do we need to do now? It's a really good idea to start with the end in mind. Think about where it is that you want to head towards. So then once, you, once you've got a target level, you think, okay, great, where am I now? So you go to E next and you do the baseline and you come up with this. And so you think, okay, this is all well and good. I know where I want to be and I know where I am now, but actually it sort of feels a bit daunting. Like I don't know how you get from, from, from E to A in this case. So then you say, okay, well, let's split the difference. Let's go to C next. What's it going to look like when we're halfway there? And you might come up with something that looks a bit like this. And by the way, the third turn, that's just like a thing from within uh, the world of dialogic education. So that's like the, the, the point at which a teacher asks something and then a kid responds. The third turn is like, what does the teacher do then on that third turn in the conversation? Do they drill down and ask the, ask the kid to, to go further? Do they just re keep repeating so what until the kid arrives at some <laughs> fundamental truth? Do they pivot to another kid? So there's a number of options that a teacher has on that third turn. It's like it's an important idea. So now we've got a three point scale and you think, okay, this is more like it, but it's still, it's a big leap from E to C and it's also a big leap from C to A. And so then you split the difference again. And so you start with what's it going to look like at B? What's it going to look like when we're, I beg your pardon, sorry, this should, these should be the other way around. This should say, this should be B and then D, but just um, look at B for now. So we think pupil talk is increasing the characterized exploratory talk and so on. So you think, what's it going to look like when we're almost there? And then I would recommend that last of all, you do D. Um, so you think, what's it gonna look like next week? What's it gonna look like in a month from now? What's my next move? And when you've done this, it's a good idea to sort of to, to populate a table like this with whatever it is that you wanted to do. And you can, what's cool about this tool is that you can use it at a number of different levels. You can do this at the level of a classroom teacher, like this one is, or it could be a, a level of a department or a year group or a phase at primary or it could be at the level of the whole school. Um, and you wanna sort of populate the grid and then, and then leave it alone for a day or two and then come back to it and think, are there, are there sort of other leaps equal? Is this a smooth scale or do we maybe need to massage it a bit so that there's no huge leap? If E to D is too big a leap, then no one's ever gonna make that journey. So you do need to think about making the, making the transition smooth between each of the sequential steps. But you get the idea and you can use this also with with young people. I've seen people using this really effectively with young people thinking about where they are now with regard to, you know, writing, you know, essays, say, and where they want to be and how they're going to get there. And what's cool about this, as I say, you can use it at a number of different levels, but you can also use it as a coaching tool. So you can sort of say, you know, where are you on a good day? Where are you? On, where are you when you're cooking on gas and when your class is all in the zone and it's amazing? And then what's it like when you're really overwhelmed and you haven't slept very well and you've got a massive pile of marking to do and it's raining and you've got a headache? Or what, what was? Where were you at the start of that lesson? Where are you at the, in, the, in, like, in the main task of that lesson? Where are you um, now? Where do you want to be by Christmas? What support do you need? you know, how are you going to get there? So you can use it as a sort of coaching tool and you can also use it as a monitoring and evaluation tool because you can ask people, you can sort of track progress along the way. 
So um, later on, as we go through this, this series of four twilights, I'm going to bring in different implementation tools. And in one of them, we'll talk about CBAM, because it's really cool. And you'll see how this Steps to Success fits within this CBAM model of, about how to bridge the implementation gap between where you are now and where you want to be. Um, and so this is an example of, of a tool that I've, been, I've recently put together, this toolkit, uh, Implementation Science for Schools. I put this about, together about two years ago, and I've been working with, with schools all over the world recently with it. Um, and it's incredible the, the, the response that I've had to this toolkit. So there's 18 episodes. This is going to be an online course, which I'm going to, I'm going to release in about a month from now. There are 18 episodes, which you can see here, and Steps to Success is just one of them. Um, and just, just to share with you some examples of the sorts of feedback that I've had, because I've never known like feedback like this. So this one, one teacher, Elaine, said, this program has been the making of me as a leader. It's something that I now take with me and apply to everything that I do. And she sees this as a framework for like ethical leadership, which is really interesting. Um, and this head teacher, Al, said, the senior team and I are really energized and much more confident about what we can do differently as a school. Um, and what's really interesting is that often when people do this training, they say, like, I wish that I'd done this years ago. We've never been trained in how to implement change effectively. Um, and that, to a, to a large extent, is, is our job as, as teachers and as, and as leaders. And this final person, Sarah, said the same thing. She was like, goodness me, I would be doing things differently if I'd had this learning first. So I'm, I'm uh, ending on a slight plug that this toolkit is going to become available in the next month or so. And we're going to be looking at uh, asking for early adopter schools to get involved with this on a reduced rate to see if we can to see if we can spread these ideas far and wide, because um, I think that this is going to be um, a big thing and it's something that's currently really missing. OK, right. We're at 40, 45 past. Here's quiz time. The first correct entry in the chat box will win a copy of Fear is the Mind Killer. So the question is, um, Fear is the Mind Killer takes its name from which famous film or book? Oh, Lisa Crowther. Well done, Lisa. Well done. Thank well done. you. You did tell us the answer earlier. I did, I did tell you the answer earlier. Well, Lisa, good listening. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa, can you jot down that email address, enquiries at rethinking-ed.org? And um, yeah, um, I will send me, your, send me your address and, and a copy will wing its way to you. Right, I will okay. um, stop there. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, everybody. A big thank you to you, James. Fabulous, informative, interactive session. I'm very keen uh, for colleagues for us to finish on time. If you're interested in implementing an approach to developing uh, metacognition, self-regulation, and developing oracy, please join us uh, for the next session, which will be in the school's mailing and on the Chartered College website. Big thank you again, James, and thank you, colleagues, for your engagement. Absolute pleasure. Lovely to be with you all. And uh, get in touch. If you want to drop me a line, you can find me um, quite easily. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. And I will look forward thank to seeing you, you next time. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, everybody.